ladies and gentlemen, our keynote speaker today is Tim Martin, the Senior Vice President of Operations for Lease Plan USA. Tim is responsible for the management of their entire domestic commercial fleet operations, including vehicle acquisitions, maintenance services, right through to marketing license, title and registration services. Prior to joining Lease Plan in 2005, Tim held various positions in operations and remarketing with Saab Cars USA, Saab Financial Services Corporation, Mercedes-Benz Credit Corp, and GMAC. Please join me in welcoming Tim Martin, Senior Vice President of Lease Plan USA. I can't see from up there. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, before I start, there's one, one, one thing, and I was thinking about it this morning when Sandy Schwartz made the comment about this being a people business. And knowing that we were going to have this time to spend with Virgil today, uh, he exemplifies all that's good about the people that make up this remarketing community. And there's folks all over this room and outside those doors and across the country that you don't even know you had an influence on. In uh, 2005, when I joined Lease Plan, I'd never been to an NAAA event. And Virgil was with ABC at the time. And I had the uh, opportunity that night to go to dinner with Virgil and his wife and sat at dinner. And he didn't treat me like a rookie. He knew I was a rookie because I knew nothing. But Virgil, I've always had a great respect for you. And it's a thrill to get to join you on the stage. Thanks. What I'm going to try to do and do it fairly quickly today is um, talk a little bit about the remarketing industry from the perspective of a consigner, um, specifically to what we're doing today. Levi and I work for a company called Lease Plan USA. We're a fleet management company in the US and a very large fleet management company in Europe and the rest of the world. Um, but I've got a little bit of a broader perspective than that. And when I first thought about it, you know, there was actually people out in the hallway chest bumping, you know, all these guys with cars to sell and everybody's so thrilled about just how well we're doing. And it is, it's a fantastic time to be selling cars. However, when I thought about, the, took it from a perspective of what's gone on in the last five years, boy, this has been a rocky road for a lot of folks. And there's a lot of folks, some in this room, who've gone through downsizing, right sizing, whatever you want to call it, um, have had to do more with less. So I, I started thinking about it and I'm like, well, how do you visualize the last five years of this industry from the, from the very bottom trough up to these peaks that we're all talking about now? And so, you know, I do what my kids taught me to do and I go out and I Google and I'm like, it's got to be a roller coaster, right? Got to be a roller coaster. So I go out and I look for images on Google of a roller coaster and I couldn't find one where the hills were high enough or the lows were low and as I went through it, all of a sudden, this popped up. And I'm like, OK, is that photoshopped? And I said, you know, I'm going to have to show you guys this. Because for some of the folks in this room, you felt like you've been riding a roller coaster on, on roller blades. Just out of curiosity, I took a little deeper dive. This guy's name's Dirk Auer. He's a German. This guy can do this at 56 miles per hour. And that's kind of what it's felt like for some of us today. And I just thought that was fascinating. If you, uh, if you Google the video, it'll blow your mind. But what, is, what has been the marketing impact on consigners as far as how have we set our strategies? And you kind of set your strategies, you know, history repeats itself. It's not going to always be what it is today for us sellers. So I've kind of looked at it from several perspectives, and they really haven't changed. The things that we do as consigners today are no different than the things we were doing back in 2007 and 2008. The questions that we get from our customers may be a little different. So there's a couple of focus areas I wanted to talk about, and specifically for the business that we're in, but I know it applies to folks, whether you have internal customers or external customers, you're all selling cars for somebody. We've had to really up the focus on educating our clients. And that education's taken a number, of, uh, a number of turns. We've had to get really, really good, and we've had to really depend a great deal on the experts in the industry, and we've had to also depend on experts that we brought into our businesses 
to try to help us better forecast market values and obviously, just as important, more importantly, residual values. At the same time, we've gotten tons of questions about, from our clients in the fleet industry about what is the optimal time to recycle our cars. And along with that, we've kind of had to spend a lot of time in our business. We always consult, but we've had to spend a lot of time setting expectations, and in some ways starting to set some realistic ex expectations. We've had, we've had clients who uh, spent a, we spent a great deal of time on, and they go, it went from where's the money to why can't you get more money to all day long it's show me the money. So I went home and I told my wife, she, I said, she goes, you have a good day at work today? And I said, yeah, I had a pretty good day. She goes, I goes, as a matter of fact, I kind of felt like Jerry Maguire. Because all these folks are saying, show me the money, show me the money. She looked at me, she says, honey, you ain't Jerry Maguire. She goes, you might be a fat, poor Jack Nicholson lookalike, but you ain't Jerry Maguire. But in all seriousness, we've had to spend a ton of time, and it's good quality time, making sure that our clients, and, and when, in our lease plan world, Levi and I have many clients, internal and external. We do closed-in leasing, and we do open-in leasing for our fleet customers. And it's all about making sure that they understand that we're going to do everything we can to make this money for them while the money's there. But we also have to prepare them for the future, whether that's 2014 or further down the road. Another area that we've obviously had to focus on, and this is an internal focus, this is, this is what we're doing as a company, is trying to figure out how you maximize the benefits from technology and innovation. And in that area, it's for us, it's really about trying to drive some real-time, detailed, and accurate information, whether we can automate, and in many cases you can, a lot of the redundant remarketing processes, and to the extent that this is possible, automating the market value pricing tools, utilizing tools within the industry and some that we developed ourselves. But the ultimate goal there is to make sure that we are giving our remarketing managers and our remarketing staff, the people that Sandy talked about this morning, the ability to spend and focus most of their efforts on where the rubber meets the road, where they can sell a car quicker, sell it for the most money, and return it to our clients. Third, it's a focus on analytics and market intelligence. And for us, it's, it's something that I knew a lot about when I worked for Mercedes, and I knew a lot about it when I worked for Saab, but didn't really hear a lot about push, push forward programs, pull back programs in the fleet management industry until recently. And so we've had to do a lot of, of uh, getting comfortable with and getting the analytics around when that makes sense or if that makes sense for our clients' cars. And then we've had to take a deeper dive into the, our channel selection process. Um, one of the luxuries, as, as I hear sometimes, is that with cars selling as well as they are, some of our folks have had more time to kind of dig in and really, from our perspective and with, the, with our data, dive in and see where we could make some changes or where we could do some things to improve our processes and how we select our uh, auctions and our upstream partners. And then it's looking for ways to, to reduce our cycle time. And then in many ways, that's also looking to be able to integrate some of the things we do with our systems with the systems of the folks that we're so uh, proud to be able to work with in this room. And just as important is we've kind of taken a, a deeper dive and a more intensified look into what it is we need to do as a consigner to bring our buyers back and to keep them coming back. So for us, it's about building a brand it's like that for most folks in this room. It's about building a brand. It's about being able to uh, build confidence with the buyers that when they show up at a sale, they're going to show up at a sale and if they see our brand or see some of the other brands, they're going to know what we stand for. So we've used some of this time to evaluate, maybe reevaluate our arbitration policies, to look at our recondition policies and make sure we're doing the things that buyers really want us to do that are really beneficial for the buyers. And it's also about engaging more with the buyers. And I'm not really talking about direct engagement. I'm talking about learning enough about from the data that we have to understand what our buyers' buying patterns are and what things they want. And it's also engaging with our partners, upstream, auction channels. Anywhere that we're partnering, we want to know from your perspective, because you're closer to this in most cases than we are, to what it is we need to be doing 
uh, to engage with the buyers and to help you in engaging to bring those buyers back. So the next question was, well, what does all these things that you're focused on have to do, or what, what's this going to do for me uh, as your partner? What do, I, what do what I need to know about that? And for us, it's about refining your value proposition. Everybody in here is doing many, many of the things that, that I'm going to speak about. Uh, but it's really about, from a consigner standpoint, is how can you build on those values that we capture from the services that you provide to us today? And not surprisingly, they kind of co coexist with the things I just talked about that we were looking internally. It's how are you going to use the technology integration and innovation as we go forward for the next decade? Data utilization, I'll talk a little bit about that because I think that's one of the areas of the business that we've got a lot of room for improvement. Market intelligence from that data. Consulting, many of you, whether it's individual auctions, whether it's our partners like Auto IMS, whether it's the large auction companies, provide a lot of information to us that adds a lot of value. And uh, I think there's, there's obvious rooms that we can grow as that partnership as well. And foremost is helping us take care of the buyers. Because no buyers, nobody does, does well. So how are we going to do that? Give the buyers the tools that they want and will use. And we saw some things from Sandy Swartz today. And you know, to be honest with you, we've seen very similar uh, progressive type technology innovation from many of the remarketing partners. F just making sure that what we're developing and what we're building is really want what the buyers want and will use. That's where we want to see the focus. Uh, enhancing online sales channel capabilities. We also saw some things about that, but I think that's an area where, as consigners, we feel like we could, we could actually spruce, spruce that up and do a much better job of getting the cars to the buyers quicker, getting the cars to the buyers in a format that they're used to seeing, live auction environments and those type of things. And it's really also refining your analytical capabilities so we can drive some of those real-time adjustments, whether it be market value adjustments, whether it be inventory availability, anything we can do that will give the consigner information up front to make a good decision about how to price a car, what a condition report really looks like, that we can also push out to the buyer so when the buyer hits the button, the buyer's getting the most updated information as well. And then leveraging the technology for operational excellence. And I know many, many of you guys in the room uh, are constantly looking for ways to cut cost and build drive efficiency in the auction lanes, in the online channels. That's something we're doing as well. Anything you can do that we can be a part of that's going to drive down uh, any inefficiencies in the process from start to finish, those are things we want to support and, and kind of partner and walk alongside you with. And then make it easier for us, for the buyers and the sellers, to utilize your services. Um, standardize where it makes sense. I know it won't make sense everywhere, but where there are opportunities for us to standardize, let's look at what we can do to, to create efficiencies there. And then from a data utilization, it's more of questions that I had. It's, you know, what are you, what are you working on that's going to allow you to be able to mine and get the most out of that large volume of data that you guys have or own? Uh, what's your strategy? We'd, I, I'd love to know more as a consigner about what's your strategy for optimizing the analytics from that information, and then how you're prioritizing that in your business. And then how will you deliver it to us at a more micro or granular level? Um, I'm a rookie in, in the full-time remarketing world. Um, really full-time last seven years, and I'm amazed at just how, how much the market's grown, how much of the technology has been able to benefit us. But I just feel like it's that old thing about how much of the human brain do we use every day. My wife says I don't use much of mine. How much of the data that you have out there are we effectively utilizing? And how do we get to that? And then how do we engage you to make sure that we're a part of being able to capture that data? And this comes back to the market intelligence piece. You know, if we can dig in and we can get to the heart of it and use 90% of the data that we have available to us, what are we going to be able to do as partners to proactively drive that into something that's actionable intelligence that we can take a benefit from and that the buyers are going to get just the same, if not more, of a benefit from. Effectively, we do it today, but there's 
there's definitely room to effectively match sellers to buyers in a more uh, micro level. And it's definitely to our benefit if we can all figure out how to effectively push that marketing intelligence further upstream in the consignment process for us. And then optimizing that strategy to drive the buyers to your sales channels and hopefully to our vehicles. And then identifying some triggers for us so that we know what it really is that drives that buyer to hit the bid or buy it now button. And very important for us, help us in defining what our role is in building that efficiency and impactful marketing approach for our vehicles. Consulting. This is one of my favorite parts of the business when I, when I look at it from what our partners bring to the table. You can't over communicate to us. If you're selling our cars, if you're trying to come in and talk to us about selling our cars, we, we love the information. We can't know everything about every market and every city and every model line. We, we welcome any and all communication. We want to know about and understand your strategy because that's the only way that we can really build on it and adapt it with our own. We want honest feedback and uh, to be honest, we don't want it sugar-coated. I, I, tell me if I can do better in a market and be honest with me about it and show me the data and the analytics behind it and we'll act on it. I think most of us want to do better. I don't think, I, I really like the idea that as a group and as a partnership we can be honest with each other. And then, obviously, we appreciate having a voice and setting strategy and prioritizing initiatives and continuing you know, to deliver those actionable items together. So I'm, gonna, I'm speeding along here. Pretty good for a southern boy who talks slow. Uh, to recap, real general, we want to focus on technology that will sell cars. We want to get the most out of the marketing intelligence that we can. Let's standardize where it makes sense. And obviously, consulting adds great value. The things that you bring to the table are greatly valuable to the folks that are selling the cars. We want to continue that open dialogue, the cooperation and partnership. And we really want to leverage what the IRA and NAAA have come to be recognized for, and that's supporting our common goals. When I was thinking about coming up here, and uh, I went back and I read an article that our friends at Bobbitt wrote last fall. And it was an article that was titled something along the lines of looking back at the accomplishments of IRA over the first decade. The interesting part when I read the article, having been a uh, late bloomer to IRA, was that many of the past presidents talked about up front not so much the accomplishments but the struggles the hurdles, the roadblocks that they had to overcome to make IRA what it is today. And that was a new awakening for me. I, because I walked into, I'll tell you the story real quick. I walked into lease planning in 2005 in the fall. The first time I knew there was an IRA was when I got an invoice <laughs> to pay for the annual dues. And, and I go up to a guy who was our, uh, our head of marketing at the time and I'm like, this has your name on it, and I don't know what it is. And he goes, well, that's the international remarketing. I'm like, okay. Well, do you ever go to these meetings? Well, no, no, we've never been. And I'm like, but we're paying these guys. So what is it? And I'll be honest with you, I was, you know, I'm kind of a skeptic. You know, I've been around the industry. I've been in other type of industry associations. And I go, okay, well, I got to tell you what. They're having a summer roundtable meeting in Dallas, Texas. This was probably, I think, 2007, somewhere in that range. Hopped on a plane, went out to Dallas, Texas. Walked into a uh, pretty lively group of folks. And the first breakout session I walked into was right when all this cooperation, the spirit of cooperation that Lane talks about, was really evident. So walked into a room, and there was a roundtable breakout session. And I believe it was on structural damage. And I sat down and I was like, five minutes into it, I'm like, boy, these guys, they're incredible. They really have a, they're doing a deep dive on this thing. And I spent the next 30 minutes praying nobody asked me a question. Because I didn't have a clue about, I was, I was, you know, you get beyond frame damage, that was about the extent of my knowledge. And that was pretty weak. So 
I will tell you that in the course of a day and a half, it was just blatantly obvious to me just how much value this, this IRE added and just how far they'd come to get the cooperation they have with the NAAA and the auction members. So looking at it now, and I'm going to close with this, we've kind of jumped into this thing. And I, I, I drug Levi McCoy, <laughs> maybe kicking and screaming a little bit, into our remarketing world about four years ago. And I told Levi, I said, you know, the one thing I can tell you, if you don't do anything else, you need to go to all the IRE meetings. And you need to bump up against all these folks in the room that you see who will all, all be great mentors for you. And I think based on our participation, Levi went overboard. <laughs> but it's been a great, it's a great thing. So when we look at IRA and where, we've, where the organization came in the first 10 years, um, I saw a quote from a guy that you don't normally see quotes from, although I heard him mentioned earlier today, and it's Bill Gates. And Bill Gates says, in business at the speed of thought back in 1999, we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. And coming from the technology guru, I thought that was just eye-opening for me. And it gives me a lot of hope that for the next 10 years, the next decade for IRA, there's a lot that we can accomplish as a group. So I'm going to close by thanking everyone in the room for participating and particularly allowing me to be here today. And to thank those guys, particularly the ones that were mentioned this morning, that have led these committees for years. Because I can see every day when I go into work and I talk to Levi, that the things that are being accomplished here with this cooperation are the things that are going to drive our business into the future. So thank you very much.